Um, my task today is to talk to you about bone marrow transplants and what I want to do is give you an overview of how the process works and I'll link it back to previous research that we've done at the Royal Brisbane and some ongoing research uh, that may be relevant to patients who are coming up to a transplant. Um, the, the type, the, the, it's called the nuts and bolts and this first slide is two young ladies who both have beaten their blood cancer. Uh, both these ladies are now, now well uh, over 10 years after having bone marrow transplants for leukaemia um, and are flourishing, living normal lives. They're both married and they're now facing the next stage of their lives which is to have children. Uh, we talk about survival curves which is the proportion of patients that survive after the procedures. We have a very interesting survival curve because after about 10 years it starts to go back up again as the next generation of children are born to long-term survivors. So in starting, I just want to give a bit of a background to how the bone marrow transplant unit in Queensland started. Now the unit's located at the Royal Brisbane Hospital and it's the largest bone marrow transplant unit in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's a unit I'm very proud to be what's now a less, a more a minor member of among a large team of doctors, nurses and scientists. In the late 1980s, if you were having a bone marrow transplant, you had to go off to Sydney and you had to go and live in Sydney uh, for many months at a time, sometimes even years at a time. Now, the fellow over on the far slide is Trevor Olson and Trevor uh, was a very um, entrepreneurial and pioneering haematologist. He started the Leukaemia Foundation out of the need to buy a cell separator machine or an apheresis machine that many of you may be familiar with. And that was the first project that garnered or created the Leukaemia Foundation. Um, Ian Bunce was a senior haematologist or the director of haematology at the Royal Brisbane. And Bev Mirillo, who now chairs the board of the Leukaemia Foundation, was the senior nurse in charge of the unit at the time. And together they then challenged the Leukaemia Foundation in the late 1980s to raise a million dollars to build a bone marrow transplant at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. And it was that endeavour to raise that million dollars, which was a community-based fundraising program that created or really gave a revel on to the Leukaemia Foundation, becoming the amazing organisation that it is today and providing the profound amount of support that it does to all of you, whether you live locally, but particularly, and I know, see many faces from rural communities in this room where you have to uplift your life and move to Brisbane for prolonged periods of time. Now, it was a community-based program. These are some slides. Um, someone gave me in Toowoomba of newspaper cuttings from the late 1980s and the pride that the Toowoomba community had with their fundraising where they way exceeded ambition and raised in the Toowoomba community more than $100,000 moving. This is back in the late 1980s that led to the creation of the transplant unit. I think this has all been forgotten. It used to be called when it was in the old uh, 9D, it used to be called the Leukaemia Foundation of Queensland Bone Marrow Transplant Unit and somewhere along the line that little bit's been forgotten unfortunately and it really I think uh, should still be there. Now, we talk about a bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant, etc. The terms become confusing to patients. All the transplants that we do are of bone marrow stem cells. We can collect them by harvesting the bone marrow, an operative procedure, very rarely done anymore, and that's where we get the stem cells from the bone marrow, or we can trick those stem cells to leave the bone marrow into the blood and then we harvest them on that apheresis machine that Trevor wanted to buy all those years ago, we harvest them by washing the blood. They are still bone marrow stem cell transplants, it's just we collect the bone marrow stem cells from the bone marrow or we trick them and collect them from the blood. There are various sources, so autologous is where we collect a patient's own bone marrow stem cell transplant. So that's where you use high dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplant, that's not what I'm talking about today. That's a very straightforward procedure, only slightly more complex than another cycle of chemotherapy. We can get them from bone marrow, uh, we can get them from peripheral blood, we can even collect them from the cord blood of the baby because the cord blood of a baby is relatively enriched in stem cells. The transplants I'm talking about today are an allogeneic transplant. That's where we get the bone marrow stem cells from somebody else. A very different procedure to you using your own and it'll be the focus of today's talk. So how does a transplant work? Well there are several phases to having an allogeneic bone marrow stem cell transplant. I'm going to use the term bone marrow transplant from now on to cover that so I don't spend two hours talking to you today. So when we're doing an allogeneic bone marrow transplant we have different phases. The first phase is the conditioning. 
and the conditioning is the drugs or radiotherapy we give to the patient before we give back the new source of bone marrow. Now traditionally the conditioning was designed to ablate the leukemia. Now I'm going to use leukemia again as an all-encompassing word. It may be that you're having the transplant for lymphoma or aplastic anemia or other reasons, but we're just going to broadly use the term leukemia. Okay? So the conditioning is the stuff we give you beforehand to condition you. Traditionally, that was meant to ablate, kill off the leukemia. So when the very first transplants were done in Seattle in the 1970s, they were done on people with completely resistant leukemia. And the idea was to kill off that leukemia, we'd have to use mega doses of chemotherapy, mega doses of radiotherapy, and the cells from the donor would rescue that person, give them a new source of bone marrow so they could overcome the toxicity. And that's the traditional ablative approach, so very intensive treatment and the cells as a rescue product. However, when we do an allogeneic transplant, we're not only transplanting bone marrow, you're also getting your donor's immune system. So it's both a bone marrow and an immune system transplant. And you acquire the immune system of your donor. And that's a double-edged sword, okay? So what's an immune system meant to do? An immune system is meant to detect foreign things and kill them. So when your donor's immune system's in your body, it recognizes you as foreign and attacks you. And that causes the major complication, which is graft-versus-host disease. However, somewhat miraculously, that new immune system is also capable of recognizing any of the residual leukemia and killing that as well. And this is the graft versus leukemia effect. So what's unique about a donor-based transplant is you acquire a new immune system and that new immune system can be partly or in some cases substantially or totally responsible for providing you with the chance to beat your blood cancer. Okay, so the first important thing to understand about an allogeneic or donor transplant is that it's both bone marrow and immune system. And the new immune system is one of the most important parts, both from the term of side effects, but also the ultimate outcome of a cure. So I'm going to go through different steps of the process. Now the first step, when you need to have an allogeneic bone marrow transplant to treat your blood cancer, is that you have to find a donor. And this can be a very frustrating thing for both the patient and the patient's family. We have to do blood tests on you, your siblings, and that's a process of tissue typing, and it's HLA typing. So it's not your blood group, it's quite different from your blood group. Your blood group doesn't matter. It's all about your tissue type. And your tissue type covers five different things that you inherit, one from your mum and one from your dad. So there are five different things, two of each. That's how we talk about a 10 on 10 match. A, B, C, D, R, and D, Q. Okay? So the first step is to do your typing and do the typing of your brothers and sisters and see if they have the same A, B, C, D, R, and D, Q. Now, because you get half from your mum and half from your dad, each of your brothers and sisters represents a one in four chance of being a match. Now, with the smaller and smaller family sizes, the chance that you can find a donor in your family is getting less. So if you've got two siblings, the chances are about 30%. If you've got three to four siblings, it goes up to about 50%. It doesn't keep adding up by 25% each time. So the majority of our patients, some will find a sibling donor, but many won't. The next step, if we can't find a sibling donor, is to take your typing and plug it into big databases from all around the world. So these are international registries. Millions and millions and millions of people have signed up, had their blood test done, and their data sits on the registry. So we plug your data in to that data and see whether there are matches there, okay? One question we always get asked when we're struggling to find a donor is, the brothers, the sisters, the aunts, the uncles, some friends want to sign up. And I always say, let the process run its things. Because if there ain't a donor among 13 million, there's not going to be a donor among 13 million and 100. So if your family and friends want to help out, the best thing they can do is sign up with the Red Cross and become a blood donor, because we're always short of blood. So if, you, if you're asked that question, tell them to become a blood donor, not a bone marrow donor. OK? So that's the second step. We try and find an unrelated donor. Now, our outcomes at the Royal Brisbane Hospital for an unrelated donor who's a 10 on 10 match are exactly the same as our outcomes with a brother and sister. So you don't have a worse outcome from an unrelated donor. It's exactly the same. 
what do we do if we can't find a fully matched unrelated donor? Usually then we'll try and, that if we can't find one, it means there's something unusual or rare about your tissue type. It may reflect back on your ancestors and different ethnic groups intermixing. So for example, uh, we'll have um, uh, people who are of mixed Polynesian and Indian descent, and they're very hard to find a donor for because you've got an unusual mixing of different types. And under those situations, we may do extended family typing, which will take the family tree and try and find out where in that family tree that rare haplotype, the rare half from mum or dad, it, where it goes. Because you may pick up the more common thing by chance. So that's the third step. There are other things that can be done if we're struggling to find a donor. We can do a cord blood transplant where we go to the cord blood registries. Not overly successful in the Royal Brisbane and something I must say that we've moved away from doing. We can do mismatches. So our outcomes for nine on 10 matches depending on where the mismatch is, whether it's an A, B, C, D, R or DQ, are also very good. And if you're in a situation where it's a high risk, we will accept a 9 on 10 match if you're under the age of 60. We also, and I'll talk about this uh, later on, have a new study at the Royal Brisbane opening up, which is a haplo-identical transplant. This is where you're a half match. So anyone who has a child who's of an age where they can donate, or a parent who's not too old to donate, has a potential donor under this program. And I'll show you a slide and how that works a little later in the talk because it's a very exciting experimental child underway at the Royal Brisbane now. Okay, so you've got your donor and you've done all your testing and you're good. They've collected more blood from the donor and recollected blood from you and they've both tested them both at the Royal Brisbane just to be absolutely sure they're a match. That's called confirmatory typing. We're now all ready to go. The second step of the process in, in having a transplant is the conditioning. And I mentioned this is the stuff we give you before the transplant to make you ready for the cells to come in for the donor. Now, as I mentioned, the traditional approach to the conditioning is an ablative approach. That's this stuff over here. That's where we're delivering the transplant or the, the chemotherapy and radiation with the idea of destroying the leukemia, destroying the bone marrow, making a space for the new bone marrow to come in. And that's still the most common way we do transplants today. But there are some diseases where we've learnt over time that this isn't important. What's important is getting the donor cells in and having charge. And all of the cure comes through the acquisition of the donor's immune system. So some patients with certain diseases will be offering these sort of transplants, which are much less intensive transplants. And these are called non-ablative transplants. And to describe a non-ablative transplant, what we do is we give you drugs that suppress your immune system. So you can't reject the donor cells when they come in. And then the donor cells come in and the donor immune system starts to grow and it takes over. And it replaces your bone marrow and your immune system with the donors without all the side effects from this intensive treatment. And as that new immune system grows, it becomes capable of recognising your leukaemia or lymphoma and makes it go away. So that's what we call a non-ablative, a less intensive transplant. Very strong on the immune ablation because you don't want to reject the donor cells but not very strong on the mild ablation, doesn't make people sick. Now, when I was in Seattle <coughs> doing my fellowship, which was a very, very long time ago in the mid-90s, they had just started doing these non-ablative transplants. And I remember one of the slides was the poor donor sitting on the machine getting all their cells collected and the patient had had the transplant at day 15 going off to get a haircut because he didn't get sick at all. And that's the theory of that sort of transplant. So depending on what your leukaemia is, and how the transplant best works, the doctors will talk about different sorts of conditioning treatments, whether it's an ablative or a non-ablative, and that's to explain the theory behind it. Now, we still do predominantly ablative transplants at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, and the two, I'll just go back a slide, the two most common regimes we use are cyclophosphamide and total body irradiation, so this is radiotherapy plus some chemotherapy, and in older people, Fladarabine plus melphalan, which was a protocol we bought in in the late 1990s. So they're the most common treatments that we offer. And these we'll do in people with particularly low-grade lymphomas or CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukaemia. Here, This is just some slides that uh, show that the, we mostly do the, the fladarabine and melphalan in the older patients, and we mostly do the TBI in the younger patients. The outcomes are very, very good. So these are the survival curves for people with acute leukaemia or myelodysplasia, which is the majority of our patients. 
And you can see that at six years, we're seeing in the vicinity of 50 to 60% of patients who have beat their blood cancer. And the difference is are, the outcomes are the same with each approach. Most importantly, age over 60. Just because you're old and you're over 60 doesn't mean you can't be cured or beat your blood cancer. You see the curve for our 60 year olds is exactly the same as our curve for the under 60 year olds. Now there is selection and the way we currently work it is we have no barriers up to the age of 65. Okay? If you're over 65 it's a function of how fit and what other medical problems you are. But just because you're over 60 and you've got leukaemia doesn't mean you shouldn't be considered for a bone marrow transplant of this type because the outcomes as you can see are identical to younger people. Okay? And in the older age groups you do much better with flu mel than the more intensive regimes. So we use the TBI regime in under 50s which is still the gold standard in our over 50s we use the fludarabine and melflan with really 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 good outcomes. Okay? And the reason it works well is it's less toxic. So this is the proportion of people who get very bad complications from the drugs we use to condition the patient. And fludarabine and melflan was much better tolerated, particularly in the older patients. Okay. So this fellow was one of the first people over the age of 60 that we did an ablative allogeneic transplant in the early 2000s, late 1990s. He's recently gone back to Germany. Um, many, many years later, and, and I know what the year was because I've got, that's the first world's greatest shave haircut that we ever did when we did the first shave, I think it was in 1999, so we had similar hairstyles at the time. And this patient I saw today, Barry was 65 when he had an unrelated donor transplant for acute myeloid leukaemia in second remission. He's now 76 and he was in the clinic seeing me today and he looks exactly the same as he looked back before he first came. So I just want to emphasise with those slides that age is not a barrier. And so if you're over 60, but you're fit and well, you benefit just as much from these procedures as, as if you're a, a younger person. And these transplants were done over a decade ago. We're even better at it now than we were then. And Barry says hello to everybody and wishes you the best of luck. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the next stage, the stem cell infusion. So I've sort of gone through this one. We can get the stem cells from the bone marrow. We really rarely take our um, donors to theatre anymore. Probably the only time we'll look at bone marrows is where an, uh, a donor particularly wants bone marrow and not the stem cells, or for one particular condition called aplastic anemia. So aplastic anemia is a rare condition, and in aplastic anemia, the graft versus leukaemia effect isn't important. So we prefer bone marrow as a source in that group of patients, but just about for everyone else, we'll ask the donor if we can collect peripheral blood stem cells. As mentioned, that's a trick where we give the donor an injection of a growth factor called GCSF, and five days later the stem cells enter the blood, and then we hook the donor up to a machine, wash the blood, and we collect the stem cells that way, and rarely cord blood. Now this was just a research paper we published in 2001, that compared using bone marrow versus peripheral blood, but we did a little trick and we stimulated the bone marrow with the growth factors and we got very good outcomes. It was published in blood, but it never really took off because we, we're, we're haematologists. We, we get the surgeons look askance at us when we go to theatre. We really don't belong. So it's really all done with peripheral blood these days. And this was a paper, again, published by us that looked at different ways or different growth factors that we can use to collect those stem cells. Um, Jeff Hill, um, many of you will be aware, Jeff is one of the leading researchers in graft versus host disease globally. He's based at the QAMR and he's done some wonderful work around what happens with stem cells and what causes GVHD and what he can do to try and unravel or diminish the risks of graft versus host disease. So you've now had your conditioning therapy, you've got your stem cells back, what happens next? We go into the period of the first two weeks. So during that period of the first two weeks, you've got no bone marrow. Yours has been destroyed, the new one is yet to grow. So during that period you've got very low blood counts. And during that period you're at risk of infection and you can get side effects from the conditioning therapy, the chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So whilst it's designed to particularly target the bone marrow, to a variable degree you can get a sore mouth, a sore tummy. Sometimes people aren't able to eat, they have to have pain relief. We have to support their nutrition and we have to give them medications to prevent graft versus host disease. Now, 
At the Royal Brisbane, they're running a study into how we best support patients during this low period from a nutritional point of view. Traditionally, we've fed the patients through the drip using total parenteral nutrition. But that's a process not without side effects, particularly in increased risk of infections and effects on the liver. And so they're investigating whether by putting a tube down the patient's nose into the tummy, they might be able to feed them using their tummy through that early period when they're feeling sick and not wanting to eat and see if they can have less complications. So you, when you go to the Royal Brisbane for your transplant, you may be asked to participate or express your interest in participating in that trial of how we support you from a nutritional point of view through the early part of a transplant, okay? The second early part is how we, or what do we do to mitigate against the risks of graft versus host disease? So how do we try and modify the new immune system of the donor attacking you too much? If we had a dial, and we could just dial up a little bit of graft versus host disease, that would be great, but we don't have that dial. So our, our approach is to try in the early days to prevent it. And there are various ways that we can do it. So when they did the first transplants, they used methotrexate on its own. They then evolved that to cyclosporin plus methotrexate, which has become the global standard for 20 to 30 years. It's why, the way we've done bone marrow transplants is to give the patient, after the cells of the donor, they comes back cyclosporin and doses of methotrexate. Various techniques have been tried. So when we give back the stem cells, the component in there that causes graft versus host disease is the T cells, the immune cells of the donor. So they've tried to do the transplant by taking those T cells out. But that ran into problems of higher risks of the graft being rejected and higher risks of the leukemia coming back because you didn't have the immune system to reject the leukemia. Now at the Royal Brisbane at the moment, through Dr Hill's work, we're doing a study using a drug called TCZ. And this is a really exciting initiative, really of quite global import. So when you, and I'll explain how this works because it's a trial that we're actively recruiting for at the moment. So the theory, or part of the theory to do with graft versus host disease is part of the problem is that conditioning, that chemotherapy and radiotherapy you have before you get your stem cells back. Now that chemotherapy and radiotherapy, whilst damaging the bone marrow, also damages other organs, your gut, your mouth, etc. And so that damaged tissue releases IL-6. And then that, when the new stem cells are coming in, they're exposed to lots of tissue damage, lots of IL-6, and that activates that immune system and acts as a trigger to create more, than, more graft versus host disease. And Jeff, through his lab, has demonstrated that very well in a mouse model. So his idea was before we give the stem cells back, we'll give this TCZ, which inhibits IL-6. So you get all this tissue damage, lots of IL-6 back, why don't we block the IL-6 by giving this medication and then give the stem cells back where there's no IL-6 and we might have less graft versus host disease. So we've done what's called a phase two study. And in a phase two study, you give a group of patients TCZ and you compare them with the previous group of patients that you did and the results were really impressive. So we grade graft versus host disease by its severity. And in our additional trial, we found that TCZ released, reduced the results, the rates of graft versus host disease from 50% down to 12%. And the severe forms of graft versus host disease down from 24% down to 4%. So it looked really, really promising. It looked like Jeff's ideas worked. The next step to prove something work is a randomized trial. So in a randomized trial, half your patients get TCZ and half of them get a placebo, and us as your treating doctors won't know, okay? And that's the study that we're enrolling actively at the Royal Brisbane at the moment. So if you're heading in for a transplant now, one of the things that will happen is the research nurses will come and talk to you about this trial. Very, very important trial. Now on that trial, there's a 50% chance you'll get the TCZ, there's a 50% chance you won't, we won't know, okay? And then in a year or two's time, we'll unravel it and see what it did. And as I said, if it works, it will change the way transplants are done forevermore. Okay, so very, very exciting trial led by Jeff Hill and Glenn Kennedy from the Royal Brisbane Hospital. And it's globally relevant. The level of interest in this trial globally is really quite massive. So you've done all that. You've been on the trial. You've got the placebo arm. You develop graft versus host disease. What do we do? We have lots of drugs and regimes to treat that graft versus host disease. So this is where you've got through the first 14 days. The new bone marrow started to grow. Your counts are coming up. Your mouth gets better. Your tummy gets better. You're starting to eat. You're on tablets. You're ready to go home and you get a rash. 
or you get some diarrhoea or your liver function tests go off. Those are the signs of graft versus host disease. As doctors, we may do a skin biopsy. We may have a look in your tummy to get a biopsy done to diagnose graft versus host disease. Then we have to treat it, okay? Now we treat it with prednisone. And we start with a very big dose of prednisone. Yes, I see someone who knows all about prednisone from that grin on your face there. We start with a very big dose of prednisone and we should see if it's gonna work, it should work in the first three to five days. So if it works in the first three to five days, we change it then over to a tablet version. And over the next couple of months, we gradually taper the dose down. And that's the primary way we treat graft versus host disease. And the majority of people respond to that. We call that prednisone responsive graft versus host disease. There are some people, however, where that doesn't work or where it works, but when you try to drop the dose of prednisone down, it flares up again. And that's either prednisone refractory or prednisone dependent graft versus host disease. And we know that's a bad thing. So we've tried different things over the years using ATGAM, switching your cyclosporin to tacrolimus, adding in mycophenolate, and more recently adding in Enbrel. And we've done a number of studies over the years to evolve that regime. Now, one of the strongest things about the outcomes at the Royal Brisbane is that it is very, the unit has an approach which is very aggressive about identifying and very aggressive about treating graft versus host disease. And very early on, if it's not working, changing over to these very complete regimes that we've studied empirically over time. And part of the reason that the outcomes at the Royal Brisbane are very good is how early we say prednisone isn't working and we switch over to these stronger and more complicated regimes. So it's a very important part of how it works. Um, this was a paper, the first author was Pete Millay um, when he was a registrar many years ago. Pete is now a senior haematologist over at PA and he published our results using our first regime which was tacrolimus and ATG. ATG is developed by injecting those donor lymphocytes that cause GVHD into a horse and then harvesting the serum of the horse to give back to the person. So it's pretty crude, can have lots of reactions, but it's still the mainstay of what we're doing. And when I was in Seattle, two of the guys there who were the founders of this, when they started this, they had all these horses out in the paddocks at the back box of Seattle. And they'd literally go and ha rope the horses up and harvest their blood and give them injections. So they really were cowboys. One of them's a Nobel Prize winning laureate now. This was the second paper. The senior author was Glenn back in 2006. Glenn's now the director of there. It says how time evolves. This was in 2006 when I think Glenn was still a registrar in the unit. And this is where we combined uh, ATG and uh, tacrolimus. We added in atanacept and we added in mycophenolate. So this is where we just took everything we had and threw it at it and we got our best results yet. So that's now our standard of care. One of the tensions in the unit is to really evaluate everything we do, collect our data and evolve our strategies to produce the very best outcomes for our patients. One of the other problems that you can get in these early days is infection. So you've had, your, your graft is taken, you've got good counts, but you've developed graft versus host disease. You're on all these drugs now to suppress the immune system. Infections can emerge. So these infections can include cytomegalovirus and fungal infections in particular. Now cytomegalovirus is an infection that two thirds of us have as children. We have the infection as a childhood, in a child like a cold, and then it sits dormant in our body. Suddenly we end up on all these drugs that suppress the immune system and this thing happens. So after your transplant, every week or sometimes twice a week, we will measure for the reactivation of CMV in your body. So one of the most important tests we do in following you up along with the levels of all your drugs is we measure the PCR for CMV. And if we see any sign of the CMV awakening, we'll then put you on drugs to suppress it. And that approach is incredibly effective. Very occasionally though, we see patients who need long-term immunosuppression who the CMV is resistant to everything we have. And this is one such patient. And he was dying of CMV infection. He'd had all the appropriate drugs. He was riddled with CMV. He had diarrhea all the time. He was wasting away. His kidneys had been damaged severely by all the drugs we used. So um, in a lab um, next door to Jeff's, they got his cells, his T cells that were in his blood, and grew up ones that could fight the CMV. And then they injected those CMV specific T cells back into him and the CMV miraculously went away. So that's yet another avenue with the collaboration that Jeff and now CIOC, um, who is another clinical transplanter who works at the QMR, QIMR, can bring these very latest strategies into the clinic in the unit to do things that otherwise, and that was the first time it was ever done in the world.
Okay, you've got through that. You've got through the magic first 100 days. So we talk about this first 100 days because that's when the bad stuff can happen. Traditionally, the first 100 days occurred because when they did the first ever transplants, everyone had to go to Seattle. So not only did I go to Seattle, but every patient around the world went to Seattle. And there had to be a point where they went home and they designated that as the first 100 days. Because if you were going well at 100 days, you're probably well enough to go home and get treated by your local doctors. So that's why we have this magic period of 100 days for all the country patients where they tend to stay in the Leukaemia Foundation accommodation, come and see us on a regular basis, and then if all of a sudden the 100 days comes up, we do all this testing and say, okay, you can go home now. That's where that comes from. But it's because the first 100 days is the highest risk period for GVHD and the highest risk period for the infections I just talked about. After 100 days, though, there still can be ongoing problems. And the biggest problems are chronic graft-versus-host disease. This is a longer-term form of graft-versus-host disease, sometimes very disabling. Risk of the leukaemia coming back. So you can do all this, and the leukaemia can still come back in a proportion of people. It's less likely to come back if you've had a little bit of graft-versus-host disease. And then there are other complications, cataracts, because of the intensity of our treatment, infertility. So it's very important before a transplant, if you're a young person, that we look at what we have to do to retain or preserve your fertility, your option to have children, long way down the track. There's also a risk of secondary cancers. And if you get bad graft-versus-host disease, it can lead to impacts on how you perform now, or function. Now, if we look at long-term survivors, people who are two years out from the transplant, 80% of them are functioning pretty normally. They might still be on some small doses of drugs, but they've got a very good quality of life. They're very much participating in the lives of their family. They're in the workforce. There is a group of about 20% who have long-term problems related to graft-versus-host disease, the medications used to treat it, and that does impact upon their quality of life and performance status. And we do our very best to minimise that, but it, it can happen. And it's an important thing to understand in your decision whether to have a transplant or not, that there is that small group of patients who have ongoing problems. Now, I just want to talk quickly about relapse. So if we take someone with acute myeloid leukaemia or acute lymphoblastic leukaemia in first remission and we do a transplant for them, we can cure about 6 in 10. About 2 in 10 will get a bad complication and may die from that and about two in 10 will have their leukemia come back again. Now, some of those who have the leukemia come back again, we can still beat their blood cancer. And we can beat their blood cancer by getting that donor immune system fired up again, okay? So we will often go and get more T cells from the donor, more immune cells, and give an immune boost, a bit like a booster dose, to try and get them to fight their leukemia to go away. And I'll just outline a, a case of a patient of mine who um, I saw just a few days ago. Um, so Robin had acute myeloid leukaemia. She had initial treatment for it. It was resistant to the initial treatment. She had a second line of chemotherapy and got into remission and then went on because she was over the age of 50. She had an unrelated donor transplant. She had no siblings. So she had that flu mel regime, that sort of middle regime I talked about. About a year later, her leukaemia came back again. She'd had no graft versus host disease up until this point. So what we did was we gave her more chemotherapy and some more stem cells back from her donor and she went back into remission. But she still didn't develop any graft versus host disease. So we knew if she didn't develop any graft versus host disease, it is inevitable that this would come back again. So we then gave her some interferon. And that interferon does the opposite of the TCZ. So the interferon causes your tissues to express all the antigens that the new immune system can see and can activate that graft-versus-host disease. And in her case, she developed graft-versus-host disease of the liver and skin a few months after having the interferon. And I saw her the other day, four years um, after her, re or almost now five years after her relapse, off all her drugs, some very minor abnormalities of her liver function, which we're happy to accept because she's still here and she's living a full and very wonderful life. She has a much better life than I do. So there are things that we can do even when the leukaemia comes back again. And this has led to yet another ongoing study at the Royal Brisbane using a different form of interferon called pegylated interferon. So this is an old-fashioned interferon that we have to give three times a week. This is just given once a week. And that's a trial that we have open. If someone's leukaemia comes back, we have a way of dealing with it formally through the Royal Brisbane. And in finishing, this is a slide for our patients with acute leukaemia. 
and you can see that we've consistently now over a very, very long time, this is 10 year follow up, we're curing 50 to 60% of patients. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter whether you've got a brother, sister donor or an unrelated donor, you still can beat your blood cancer. Now, in closing, I just want to talk about a very new trial called a haploidentical transplant. So if we look for, you haven't got a brother or sister, we can find an unrelated donor transplant depending on your ethnic origin for between 30 and 70% of people. So there's a proportion of people we just can't find a donor for. And in an endeavour to, to look after those patients, C. Octay and Jeff Hill have developed a process called a haploidentical transplant. This is where you use one of your children or one of your parents who are only a half match. Now if we did the standard ablative transplant for that situation, everyone would die of graft-versus-host disease. So in this transplant, they take the donor cells and they remove the T cells. They're the immune cells, so they take them out. They give you back the cells without the T cells and they grow, but you don't get any graft-versus-host disease. They take the T cells from your donor and they genetically modify or engineer them. And they insert what's called a suicide gene or a switch off gene into those cells. And then they give them back to you. And if you get bad graft versus host disease, they can give you an injection that activates the suicide gene, those cells die and the graft versus host disease stops. Okay, so that's a new trial that we've just started at the Royal Brisbane that really means a donor for all, okay? So if you're run up to the stage or you know somebody and they can't find a donor, this trial is up and going. It's really very cutting edge. The Italians have been doing it for a number of years. We've really adopted these techniques from Italy, but they've got very um, fine techniques for measuring the immune system, the immune activation, and all this stuff in Dr. Hill's and Dr. Tay's labs, so that this is a real reality and is an up and going trial now. So there are a lot of people responsible for the work. Um, when you have your transplant, that's the inpatient unit now at 5C with an amazing dedicated group of nurses. Um, it's a very high put unit. It means they do a lot of transplants. They do them over and over again the same way. That's how you get a good outcome. You get a good outcome by going to a place where they do the same thing over and over again. And they have protocols for if graft versus host disease happens, if you need nutrition, if you get bad graft versus host disease, if you get infections that are not responsible to treatment, or if your leukemia can come back, you've got all bases of your care covered as required. That's what the Royal Brisbane does because it's a very high output unit. These are our lab scientists, and obviously um, the team that finds your donors and does all the coordinating behind the scenes. This is my Brady Bunch slide of the different people who are in the unit. Um, some of the pictures are a bit scary, uh, but that's not really how they look. So Glenn Kennedy up on the fair le far left, Glenn was a registrar in the unit many years ago, he's now the director. Simon Durrant um, has been the director since 1991, Simon's now uh, moving on in age so he still has a very important role there but he's recently stepped down from the director role. Jeff Hill on the right is one of the world's leading experts on graft versus host disease. We are so lucky to have Jeff in Brisbane and you can see from what I've talked about, Jeff's taken work in mice and he's actually transferred it over to human studies that I think will change how bone marrow transplants are done forevermore. Um, so they're the other members of the team uh, in different shapes and sizes. Uh, uh, and you will be referred to one of these doctors uh, to have your transplant done. And finally, this was a patient of mine I saw the other day. One of the best things that can happen down the track is you get to meet your donors. So people ask, how do I meet my donor? So if you want to meet your donor, if it's an unrelated donor, after you're out after a year, you can write your donor a letter. Prior to that time, we don't want any contact. So we can't tell you where your donor's from. We can't tell you, when you where they're getting their cells collected. The donor needs to be protected by anonymity or otherwise it will muck up the whole process with unrelated donors. But after a year, you're able to ask if you can get in contact with the donor. Now this lady had follicular grade 3 lymphoma. She was treated with standard CHOP treatment, had a remission. After a year she relapsed. She had DICE, standard second line therapy, an autologous transplant using her own cells. After a year she relapsed. We gave her a gemcitabine regime. She achieved a, th a third remission and she's now a long term survivor more than 10 years out from her transplant. And last year she went over to America and met Chuck, who was her donor. And she and now Chuck are best of mates. And Trish was in the clinic the other day. She's also 11 years out after a transplant, 
working full time and having a normal life because she beat her blood cancer. Thank you very much. Uh, it's all to do with risks. So when we do the donation, we give the donor growth factors. That causes their white cell count to jump very high. It changes the activation of some of those white blood cells, and that carries some small but not zero risks for the donor. So we have to protect our donors. So we have an age limit for our donors of around 70, just like the Red Cross has an age limit for age to donate blood and platelets. It's a point of safety. The worst thing you can do is hurt a donor. So we are very protective of our What's donors. The, the royal, it's about 70 at the moment for a donor. Okay, um, but we, but the donors have to be medically reviewed, and they have to be medically reviewed by someone different from the doctor who you're looking after you for a transplant because he's biased or she's biased. So it has to be completely independent, and and donor protection is above and beyond anything else that we do in the unit. No, the, the, no, you saw that slide I did from Dr. Hill's lab where he used different methods of measuring um, a lot of different things in the donors and we, we haven't found any long-term problems with the donor's immune system and no early increased risk of infection. So there is some transient change in some of the things that we call cytokines, which are some of the funny proteins released in the blood, but they're not sustained and that hasn't been a problem for our donors. So I think if you've got the potential to be a donor, you can be reassured that it's a relatively minor procedure. The biggest challenge is do you have good veins or not. So to put you on a machine to collect your cells, we've got to be able to take the blood out of one arm into a machine, which is a bit like a washing machine. It spins the blood, goes into layers. We take off the stem cells and return the rest to you. If your veins aren't good enough for that, we'll have to put in a temporary line. So that's actually the biggest hassle is having to put in a line. Beyond that, it's not a really big deal. So, look, she probably needs a few days off after the procedure and obviously during the period of the growth factor. Some people can re react to the growth factor needles, sometimes with fever, feeling non-specifically unwell. But the vast majority of donors cope very well taking the stride. We see the donors on the day their stem cells going back, sitting next to talking to the patients and they're fine. Oh, well, as someone who's now getting much longer in the tooth since 1995 when I went to Seattle, we've come an enormous way. You know, ultimately, one day we may not need to do these transplants anymore. So the sort of new age way of treating leukaemia, the targeted treatments, unravelling the genes that are responsible and targeting those genes, that remains the holy grail. I think that's some way off. It's certainly the case that, for example, people with chronic myeloid leukaemia Prior to 2000, that was the major indication for having one of these donor-based bone marrow transplants. We very rarely see a patient with chronic myeloid leukaemia anymore because we have a magic tablet that switches it off. But whether we'll have that magic tablet for other things, I think, is very open to debate. There are probably some conditions like low-grade lymphoma, maybe chronic lymphocytic leukaemia, where we'll need to do this procedure less often. But I think still for acute leukaemia and myelodysplasia, this remains the only way to cure many patients for quite a long time yet. Best of luck to all those people who are coming up to the front.